Welcome to Texas 2036's virtual series, Straight Talk Texas, where you have a front row seat to conversations on topics important to our future. My name is Enisha Shropshire, Director of Board and External Affairs here at Texas 2036. Texas, and Houston in particular, is a top oil and gas producer here in the US. But due to a drop in consumption triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic, we are faced with a huge oversupply. Today, Texas 2036 President and CEO, Margaret Spellings, We'll have a conversation with the CEO of Center for Houston's Future, Brett Perlman, on the impact COVID-19 is having in Houston. Margaret, over to you. Thanks, Anisha, and thank you, Brett, for joining us today. Uh, Brett and I have known each other for a very long time, uh, having served together in the Bush administration when uh, Brett was a member of the Public Utility Commission, so he is a policy wonk and energy expert. Uh, and has seen a lot of things over his career. And so it's a real treat to, to be with you today, Brett. And I wanna dive in right where Anisha left off and that is in my you know, hometown, Houston, the energy capital of the world and uh, what's going on in the energy industry today with the supply issues, the price issues, and, uh, and then of course the overlay of COVID-19. Yeah, well, Margaret, you know, we live, we're living the uh, curse. We're living in interesting times here. And I, I think what we've seen over the last, you know, month or two has really been not only unprecedented in terms of the, the healthcare impacts, but also in terms of the impacts on the energy industry. You know, um, we're in a world now that's awash in oil. I don't think anyone would have predicted this uh, even a couple of months ago. Uh, this was a scenario that really was in, in, in no one's uh, playbook and uh, really had the, to do with the combination of two factors. It was the um, obviously uh, this crisis that we're in from a healthcare standpoint, w which has really resulted in a tremendous drop in demand. Uh, we've lost about 30% of the world's demand in energy, and no one would have ever expected uh, to see that happen virtually overnight. And at the same time, we, we're in this sort of geopolitical game where the Saudis and the Russians have decided to play chicken over world energy policy. And at the same time, while demand was dropping, we had supply increasing. And so we had the combination of these two factors uh, happening at the same time that no one would have predicted. And you know what we've seen is um, governments have started to try to address this. The Trump administration got involved last week um, and negotiated a, um, an agreement that took about 10 uh, million barrels a day out of the mix. Uh, but when you're losing 30 million barrels a day in terms of demand, it just wasn't enough. And so what we saw um, at the first part of the week this week was something we've never seen before. Uh, we saw prices go negative. We've never seen, uh, at least in the oil and gas industry, a time when uh, you had to pay someone to take your oil away. And so this has really been an unprecedented situation. Yeah, and um, you know the, how how long this will go on uh, is is something I want to probe uh, with you because uh, obviously there's going to be consolidation in the industry. And what are what are going to if we were sitting here talking two years from now, eighteen months from now, what would the industry look like? And and what about the dislocations uh, of employees that this is going to cause? And and how should we be thinking about that now? Yeah. You know, you know, Margaret, I wish my crystal ball were a little clearer, um, but it's not. The only thing we can do is we can look at where markets are telling us. And so if you look at the Ford market, which is an indicator of, you know, where uh, traders and uh, think that the market is going, what we've seen is we've seen prices kind of in the $30 range. Mm -hmm. And then if you go out, uh, you know, in five years, and if you go out another uh, five years beyond that to sort of uh, 2030, you see prices returning in the $50 range. So the market's telling us that prices um, are going to be markedly lower than what we've seen in the past. How long that lasts, I really don't think we know today. It kind of depends on what happens, um, you know, uh, in terms of how soon the recovery is. You know, we've all become amateur epidemiologists in some ways, uh, sort of trying to guess about uh, what the recovery is going to look at like. Um, but, you know, I guess what I would say, Margaret, is um, you know, the impact is clearly in the short term is going to be pretty substantial, at least on the energy industry in Texas. Uh, we're about three times the size. Uh, our shale industry, for example, is about three times the size of any other state's industry. And um, so we are a big player in this. And we've seen, you know, a tremendous drop in activity in terms of uh, the, the rig count, which is something that people follow 
um, and that's going imp to uh, impact uh, production. So we could see, you know, U.S. production drop anywhere um, from 13 million barrels a day to somewhere, you know, around 10 million, and that's going to have an impact uh, in terms of the amount of uh, oil, oil and gas that we produce in Texas. And so how do we think about, uh, you all have, were on the, the leading edge of thinking about a low carbon, lower carbon world, and with prices as low as they are, uh, you know, what's the nexus there? Does that mean, you know, renewables and other things that may be more expensive to produce are, are put off? Uh, obviously, we're all sitting around in our homes, manufacturing is offline. I mean, how do we think about the, these issues and, and the connectedness to that low carbon trajectory? Well, I, you know, I, I, Margaret, I think it's kind of a long term and a, uh, a short term sort of thing. I think in, in the short term, we've seen uh, capital budgets being cut, uh, certainly in the energy industry. Um, that's going to make it more difficult uh, for some of the, the players that we're going to, you know, play in this energy transition, perhaps to look at renewables and other things. Mm -hmm. You know, on the other hand, we've seen some of the, um, uh, particularly the European energy companies sort of even reaffirm as uh, even today, uh, there's an article in the, um, in the Chronicle by BP that talks about, you know, reaffirming their goals uh, for the energy transition and uh, Shell is basically doubling down. And so, uh, you know, I think what we're going to see is these trends that we've seen over some period of time, the underlying trends towards moving to away from oil and gas uh, as, uh, and using gas as a, trans as a transition fuel uh, to, you know, new forms of energy, I, I don't think that's going to stop. And so while this pace of change in the short run may uh, slow down, and obviously even in terms of just um, the amount of airtime that people are getting for climate change and things like that, uh, that may change. But I think uh, ultimately at the end of the day, uh, these trends are too, uh, are too large to stop. And so I don't think you're going to see uh, that trend uh, abate at all. And so that is a challenge, and we're looking at that challenge at the center. So that's some of the work that we've been doing uh, to try to position Houston for that, uh, for that energy transition. Before we leave uh, energy and go to, to resiliency and lessons from Harvey, uh, let's talk about the implications of all of this for our state's coffers and the ability to invest in all the many needs that are being surfaced in light of this, whether it's broadband or health needs and, and whatnot? Yeah, I think um, both in terms of revenue and in terms of GDP and jobs, it's going to have an impact. There's just no question about it. You know, the, the, uh, the size of that impact, I think, is really um, yet to be determined. It, it really depends on how, how large um, and how long this lasts. Um, but we are a state that still depends heavily on sales tax revenue and uh, property tax revenue. Uh, to run the state government, to run county governments, uh, to run local governments, and there's no question that this is going to have an impact. And so, uh, you know, we do have a rainy day fund, as you as you well know, uh, approaching something I believe you probably know this number better than I do, about nine billion dollars. And uh, that, you know, I think that if it, if this isn't a rainy day, then uh, it's hard to see what would what would be. So uh, yeah. that's going to have to tend, uh, you know, perhaps. Uh, help us through this transition, uh, and then we'll have to see when prices start to come back. But it's yeah. undoubtedly going to have an impact. The rainy day fund uh, isn't going to be big enough to fill the hole we have, but it's a it's a start. It's it's going to be part of it. So that's going to be it's going to be a challenge over the next year or two for sure. You know, we were all proud of the way Houston responded in light of of Hurricane Harvey and in the aftermath, the the resiliency, the planning. Uh, that was done. Give what what's similar and what's different about this uh, situation. What can we take away from that lesson? Well, it's it's interesting because I don't think that in terms of uh, thinking about all the ways that Houston could be resilient, anyone was planning for a pandemic. And uh, we've been talking uh, to some experts um, in this field at UT Public Health. I, I really do think there is more work to be done in, in thinking more broadly about resilience. So. While we started to think, I think, uh, after Hurricane Harvey, very specifically um, about resilience, uh, flood resiliency, um, you know, we missed this uh, idea that um, we can't just fight the last battle. Uh, and I think that's what we tended to do, frankly, after Harvey. And now we have another um, crisis that we're facing that we weren't prepared for. And um, 
I, I think that we need to look at, have a broader framework for thinking about resiliency is, you know, pandemic wasn't on anyone's radar screen. Well, what's gonna happen during the next drought? Uh, what's gonna happen during the next water shortage? These are all crises and we don't have uh, yet a way to plan uh, to be resilient so that we can recover from these shocks. We sort of make this up as we go along. And that's unfortunate. So I think more work needs to be done, uh, frankly, to think about what does it mean uh, to live in a world where we're going to have these increasing shocks over time. And yeah. uh, while we've done a lot of that work on, you know, I think on, flood res on floods, uh, that wasn't the problem this time. It was um, something we didn't expect. So resiliency has to be viewed as a broader a sort of thing, um, uh, as a broader set of um, uh, tools that we need to have in the toolkit to address all kinds of different uh, types of problems. Well, and we think that Texas 2036 and the work of organizations like both of ours, uh, you know, is needed more than ever to have a plan, to have some sites uh, ahead and, and figure out how are you going to set priorities in this, in this time. Yeah, you know, Margaret, it's really interesting because I, I think that we got into to this um, time when we were a little bit complacent in mm -hmm. terms of how we were thinking about our state. You know, times were good. Texas and, miracle. Yeah, and we weren't we weren't really focused on this. And now I think it's become clear uh, that we do need to plan and um, we do need to think about this. And so I think uh, the work that you're doing, obviously, um, at Texas 2036 is, is is so important to thinking strategically. Uh, about the future of the state. So that's become clearer more than ever. So, you know, thanks for being on the on the cusp of what's becoming a, I think, a increasingly important uh, movement in our state to be, you know, to think about the future. One of the major pieces of Houston, obviously, is the incredible medical center. And uh, obviously health and health care are front of mind these days. Uh, talk about what you're seeing down there, uh, I, you know, as a, as a proud Houstonian and the responsiveness in that industry, in that sector. Yeah, I think we've done a great job um, in coming to together as a community to address the crisis. Um, you know, I've been sitting, uh, I've had a front row seat at some of these discussions, uh, and I've really watched the medical center uh, folks in TMC and others in the healthcare industry uh, really work together in an amazing way. Uh, with the business community uh, to try to, you know, put together, to cobble together uh, a plan. Uh, I think the real challenge for us, uh, and so we're doing quite well, I think, in terms of, uh, if you look at, we look every day at the, you know, at um, uh, bed capacity, at things that no one even knew about, the ventilator capacity. Who knew that we would all become experts in the number of ventilators that we had, oh, you know, wow. available. Um, yeah. And so we have, uh, we have done a good job in sort of making uh, that transition to, to make sure that we can address this, this problem. Um, I really do think, though, that, you know, this is going to be a more complex uh, challenge in how we get, that, get back to work. It's not simply about uh, saying that, you know, we're ready for business because uh, this, uh, this is a very complex sort of thing. How do we think about um, working in an office environment? Um, you know, uh, with the risk of infection still. And we haven't, there's going to be a lot of thought that needs to go into some of that before we can, before we can reopen. Uh, Say a little bit more about that, if you don't mind. I mean, I think, you know, it, it seems, it sounds so good on its face. I mean, what are the kinds of things that employers and, and we as uh, employees and citizens need to be thinking about those little details that yeah, matter. Yeah, so we, we, we talk to, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to differ by industry sector. So we talked to um, uh, Dr. Eric uh, uh, Bauerwinkel, who's the Dean of UT Public Health yesterday on our webinar. Mm -hmm. And he just pointed out that this is going to, it's going to be, we're going to have to think differently about this. We're going to have to figure out how do we live with this disease. The idea that we're going to beat this you know, and that it's going to go away, that we have to have a completely different change in mindset. And so that mindset is going to, is going to drive how we think about going back to work. Can we sit, you know, um, uh, you know, next to each other? Do we have to be six feet apart? Uh, what do we do when someone in the office gets sick? Does that mean that everybody uh, can't show up for work? This is a very uh, complex thing to restart a, an economy as diverse as ours, uh, and not result in, you know, a situation where we're going, uh, um, we're having these um, 
uh, fits and starts uh, in restarting the economy. I don't think anyone wants to see that. And so I, I really think that this is going to take some time and some thought. I know a lot of people are working on this problem, uh, mm -hmm. but it's going to be much more complex than people think. Uh, the other thing I would say, uh, and this is just my own personal opinion and I'm talking to some of my colleagues, is there's just a lot of fear out there right now for people who don't, may not go want to go back to work. So in some ways, we can say the economy is open, but that doesn't mean it's going to be open because um, people who aren't essential, who, don't, who can work at home like you and I, uh, we may choose to do that for some time as opposed to taking the risk of going back in the office. So really, this is, you know, not only... Um, a, um, a crisis, an economic crisis, it's a crisis of confidence. And we're gonna have to rebuild our confidence that we know how to tackle this and know how to work together as a state. So that's why I think we're gonna start to see that this is a much more complex sort of thing than saying that we're open for business. You're, uh, you're answering my last question, which is what advice do you have for the governor's task force uh, one of the things that, that strikes me is obviously our mayors, our county judges, our governor, there's our president, uh, there's not always a consistency of, of messaging. And so uh, I guess my question is, what advice do you have for our leaders in this time as they try to educate all of us in what you just said, this, this new nor so-called new normal? Yeah. Um, you know, I would just, uh, we've been doing on our webcast, we had uh, Kirk Watson, who I know you know well, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he has, uh, he's going to be the dean of the um, University of Houston, your alma mater, uh, uh, public policy school. And he said some of the, you know, I think the most interesting things is um, we need to first listen to the experts. Um, we can't decide when the virus, the virus is going to tell us when, what we can do. So this has to be driven. Uh, it's a technical problem. It needs to be driven by advice of experts of of those who know, who understand these sorts of things. And so I think listening to the experts is the first thing that we need to do and sort of be guided by what we can and can't do. So I think that's sort of this idea of, um, you know, um, taking this step by step, by experimenting, by moving forward a little bit, seeing how it goes, seeing whether we can go to the next step. I think that's gonna be really important. Uh, and I think that's gonna, it's, that is a different frame of reference than perhaps we were thinking about even a week ago or two weeks ago. So. That's what I think it's gonna to take to, to get back to work. And I think there's no question everybody wants to get back to work. It's important for uh, the energy industry, like we were talking about before. It's important for our economy. It's important for our mental health, frankly. And um, in order to do that, you know, we, we need to make sure we do it right. So that would be my advice I think, at the end of the day. That's, that's perfect. We can leave it there because what that says to me is the need for data, the need for us to understand, are we making progress? Are we slipping back? And uh, clearly that's something that we at Texas 2036 and the Center for Houston Future are data-based, fact-based, research-based uh, organization. Uh, let me just get, ask you for any parting comments that you have for us. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing down there to elevate these issues and for your leadership. Um, and before I turn it back to Inisha. Well, Margaret, I just am so proud to have the opportunity to work with you again after 20 years and to, to work with Tom. Thank I really you. do think that um, we can work, this kind of work that we're doing together, this is absolutely the right thing to do. And hopefully together we're gonna make this uh, uh, the state that we all hope it will be and look at the future that we all wanna see. So uh, thanks to you for all, all the work you're doing and uh, just look forward to uh, continuing to work together. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> uh, Anisha, off to you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much, Brett, for joining us. And thank you all for watching Straight Talk Texas. If you have any questions or feedback, please email us at straighttalk at texas2036.org. And please sign up to receive our emails and follow us on social media. Visit texas2036.org for more information. And until next time, wishing you and your family well.